Okay, so here's the vocab tutorial for weeks five and six. The first word is abhorrent, and I want you to ignore the part in parentheses where it says followed by two. I would explain that if you needed to know it, but it's not exactly true anymore. Um, the strongest word that I see is loathsome. Um, it has repugnant, if you know what that means. I think another word that is uh, that would be good to put on there is repulsive because this is a very strong word and we use abhorrent to describe something that would make us to absolutely pull back in extreme horror and disgust. Um, maybe it's like I don't like uh, abhorrent violence in movies because I am really just extremely disconcerted by uh, unnecessary violence. Uh, I would say uh, the, the example sentence is, please do not ask me to tell an untruth. Lying is abhorrent to me. Well, I, I am thinking about maybe some uh, slavery in history. Slavery is an abhorrent part of our history as a nation. It's something that is so repulsive, so repugnant. Uh, it's even stronger, okay, like the word abhor, that's a verb, and it is to, it says utterly detest, hate, loathe. This is a word that is even stronger than hate. So you would not use it to say, I abhor spinach. That's too strong of a word for talking about something you don't like to eat. Um, you might say, I abhor um, bullying, uh, extreme, but again, this is a very strong word and it's reserved for just the very strongest of things. I can think of something um, like some people enjoy hunting and some people abhor it because they feel like it's cruelty to animals and it's something that really, really, really bothers them. Okay, enough said. Here we come to admonish. Um, this is a word that has so many applications. It has, it covers a wide range and so does the noun form, which is admonition. But if I admonish someone, I just caution them. It could be as small as uh, your mom, okay, let's look at the sentence. The teacher commended me on my improvement in writing, but admonished me. She got on to you. She, she fussed at me for my lateness to class. Uh, your mom might admonish you to um, change your outfits before going down, uh, before going out of the house. Maybe she, uh, I'm sorry to use this example, but maybe she thinks that you are looking like a hoochie and she wants you to change your clothes before you go out of that house. She's going to admonish you. She's going to reprove you gently, but seriously. She's warning you of a fault. She's cautioning you. Okay, so her admonition to you might be, uh, get back in that house and put on something more modest, more decent. Okay, then we come to ambrosial. Ambrosial. This is extremely pleasing to the taste or smell. Delicious, uh, like the food of the gods. Okay, the sentence, taste this ripe pineapple. It has an ambrosial flavor. Well, it really, um, this word ambrosial almost always refers to food. Food more than smell. So if you'll just remember that, ambrosial goes with, oh, it tastes so, it tastes so good, a food word. Okay, um, confine as a verb means to imprison, to shut up, uh, to, yeah, to imprison. And the antonym is the verb to free. So here's confine. On July 14, 1789, a date that you will soon memorize, a Paris mob freed the prisoners confined in the Bastille prison. Okay, so confinement is, uh, in this case, most literally imprisonment. 
Uh, sometimes people experience confinement in their homes if they are invalids. Haven't we had that word? Invalids where they can't get out, then they really have to endure confinement in their homes. Okay, we come to decade, which I think you should all know that this is a period of 10 years. So in the, in the U.S., the 1930s were the decade of the Great Depression. Detonate, as a verb, is to explode. Uh, fallout showed that a nuclear device had probably been detonated or exploded. And then detonation is just the noun form of explosion. So you might say, uh, I found out later that the tremendous noise we heard was the detonation of dynamite. Okay, then we come to a word that you are probably completely unfamiliar with, but will be tested multiple times on either this quiz or next week or both. I just can't remember because I haven't looked at the quiz yet. But the word ephemeral means very temporary. Uh, is that even, no, that's not even one of your definitions, but that's the best one for it, temporary. Uh, a literal ephemeral is lasting one day only. That's not a good definition to study because um, it, that's, too, that's too specific. So ephemeral, why don't you just write in temporary? You see the short-lived, that's a pretty good uh, definition also. And then the antonym of ephemeral is permanent. So let's look at the sentence. Daylily blossoms are ephemeral. They last only for a day. Well, that's not very helpful. How about this, that popularity is sometimes, political popularity is sometimes ephemeral. It doesn't last forever for many people. Um, okay, then we come to gullible. I thought we had this recently. Maybe that was my level class. Easily deceived or cheated. And the antonym of gullible is astute. Boy, Cassius, in Caesar, Cassius was very astute. He was not gullible. He was not easily deceived. And when Antony came after, the, after Caesar was dead and he shook hands with the conspirators, but then Antony talks to Caesar and he says, oh, uh, thou art the ruins of the noblest man that ever lived in the tide of times. Cassius is like, he's astute. He's thinking, this guy doesn't sound like he's going to be with us. Whereas Brutus was more gullible. Uh, he was easily deceived. But I do want to warn you that I don't know which week it will be on the test, maybe both, but you definitely need to know that credulous is a synonym of gullible. That word credulous, was, it, it could be defined as you believe anything you're told. You are very credulous. You don't stop to think, no, wait a minute, because you're credulous. You just believe it automatically. Look at the sentence. A few investors were gullible enough to buy the worthless stock, but most were too astute to be deceived. And then the verb gull is to deceive or cheat. This is becoming less and less common to use this word as a verb. But still, I can't remember. You might need to study it. And then haggle, I bet you already know this word. It's a verb, and it means to argue over price in a very petty or small way, like you're bargaining, you're wrangling. Um, it used to be said that, I suppose it's like this still in Mexico. I haven't been to Mexico in many years, but uh, when we went one time, we were trying to buy an item, and uh, we, my husband was haggling with the merchant trying to get a better price. And you see the sentence, have they agreed on a price yet, or are they still haggling? Okay, immerse. There are two definitions. One is a literal, which means to plunge, to dip or duck in liquid. Look at this. I filled a basin with lukewarm water and immersed my foot in it. Um, some churches uh, perform baptism by immersion. That's where they dip you completely under the water. Okay, so uh, if you immerse your foot in water, your foot is inside the water. 
Um, okay, and then the second definition is a uh, figurative one. Engross, absorb. Look at that sentence. She is immersed in her book. I would say nowadays it's more common to see kids immersed in their cell phones and just, you know, fix like their necks are going to start being bent, I'm sure. Okay, immersion is the state of being deeply engrossed, engrossed, sorry, absorption, or it could be, again, completely underneath water. Um, let's see, immersion. I'll try to come back to that and give you, uh, because of her immersion in, uh, while watching TV, because of her immersion while watching TV, she did not hear her little child crying, oh dear. Okay, insomnia, I bet you know this, it's the inability to go to sleep and it's an abnormal wakefulness or sleeplessness. The former hostages now get a normal amount of sleep. During their imprisonment, they suffered from insomnia. And then an insomniac is a person suffering from insomnia. Okay, then we have lapse as a noun. And it could mean one of two things. The first is a mistake. Uh, and usually it's a pretty small mistake, but not always. Sometimes it's a big mistake that because it has big consequences. Um, and then the second definition is interval. So let's look at number one, a slip error. A slip is probably not good for you to, I bet y'all don't know that word as much as an older person would. So it's an error, an accidental mistake, a trivial fault. I wrote your name with one T instead of two. Please forgive the laps. Or, um, I, I'm, I made a lapse in, this is where it's a little bit more serious. Uh, I made a lapse in judgment. I was going 70 in a school zone. Yeah, that's a big lapse. It's gonna cost you big money. All right, number two is an interval. He returned after a lapse of 10 years. So he returned after an interval, a time period of 10 years. That's what the word interval means. It means time period. Okay, then probe as a noun, I would just circle the word investigation. That's just really um, a good synonym for probe. A probe is being conducted, an investigation is being conducted to learn what happened to that missing money, what happened to those missing funds. And then a prober, which you almost never hear this word used in this way, but a prober is an investigator. Um, then the word render, which can be really hard for people who do not watch this tutorial. Render as a verb either, mean, either means to hand down officially as a verdict. You see it says deliver as a verdict hand down officially. So here's the sentence. Tension was high in the courtroom as the jury filed in to render its verdict, to officially give its verdict. Uh, but um, I think I wanna save my, here's the really helpful part if you watch this tutorial. The noun form rendering you see it says presentation, interpretation. This is almost always applied in an artistic sense. So you see that the word render as a verb is not necessarily applied to the art world because it's talking about in a courtroom, a judge rendering a decision or a jury rendering a verdict. Uh, but when you use rendering as a noun, you would say something like, I really love uh, the artist's rendering of A Tale of Two Cities. Like on the book, this is a very famous painting. I, one of my students many years ago told me that this was maybe the cover of a Coldplay album, if I'm not getting this mixed up. But anyway, this is an excellent rendering of the French Revolution. 
I have many uh, renderings in my room that were done by students of various book covers or uh, whatever, but you get the idea. It's basically an artistic presentation, an artistic interpretation. Okay, and then we have repast, which is just a very sophisticated word for meal. Um, she eats little. Her lunch would hardly make a repast for a sparrow. So isn't that, uh, we're going to use this word in about the middle of the book of Attila Two Cities, and it's just the perfect word. Oh, I love it. Okay, um, then replenish. Replenish means to refill. Every 200 miles, we stopped at a service station, that means a gas station, to replenish the gas tank. Easy enough. Score. Score as a noun means 20. Do you remember four score and seven years ago? Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address. So that means four times 20 plus seven years ago, 87 years ago. So here we have 20, score 20. We have 19 signatures already. And if we get one more, we'll have an even score, an even 20. And then we have snub as a verb and snub as a noun. Let's, this is very easy. An act of, or instance of snubbing. Well, that's not helpful. Treating with contempt. How about, ooh, a slight? Do y'all know that word? Like, um, I cannot forgive that slight. I don't know if you do, but it's basically when someone rejects you by ignoring you. Maybe, um, let, let's look at the sentence. Why did Sharon invite everyone but me? Was it just an oversight or a deliberate snub? If she, if she did that on purpose, if she deliberately did not invite you, if she rejected you, that's a snub, a rejection, a slight. Um, maybe you better add the word a rejection or a slight. I don't know if you know rebuff, a rebuff or an insult. Okay. It's not like an insult like you and I think of insult today. That's why I don't really want you to, to study that part. Okay, and then we have a verb, snub, to treat with disdain or contempt. You know, I think of the snob. Do y'all know that word? Do they still have snobs today? Um, I think of a snob who would snub you. She would not. Oh, hey, you want to be in my group and work together? That's a snub. She's snubbing you. She does not want to work with you because you are not cool enough for her. Okay, um, then we come to suture, which is just another word for stitch. Um, like a few days after the cut finger was sewn together, the patient returned for the removal of the sutures, for the removal of the stitches. And then a great word, a great word for you to start incorporating into your vocabulary. This is a keeper. Unwittingly, it's an adverb that just means unintentionally, by accident, inadvertently. So we have three synonyms, unintentionally, accidentally, inadvertently. Wow, I would just love it if you started using unwittingly, unintentionally, inadvertently. That should be a part of your speech. Uh, another one that you could add to that that will help you uh, with unwittingly is unknowingly. Not always does it have that uh, synonym, but it could. Um, I unwittingly opened a letter addressed to you. Please forgive me. That's when you just didn't even look at the name on it. I do this uh, quite frequently at my house when we're opening boxes that come in the mail uh, or from Amazon, whatever. Uh, I have other people who live with me and so if I don't look at the label on the box I might unwittingly open their package and it's not meant for me 
So um, I think that that's it. And these all seem very doable. So study well and be a vocab victor.